welcome you all to this station. Uh, I'm not used to speak on the floor, but uh, I think <laughs> as I'm talking about simulation, it is a sort of uh, experiential learning for me, so I'll try my best. Okay. So uh, I have no disclosure. Uh, I will show some photos during my presentation on some um, commercial products, but I do not intend to uh, endorse the use. So to start with, I would like to um, uh, share with you two cases, and then I will follow up with uh, a collection of uh, important points that I think uh, is important when we are conducting simulation training. So it's more uh, opinion-based rather than uh, evidence-based uh, presentation. So for the first case, um, this is case related to tracheostomy. So in, in Hong Kong, there was a, a tracheostomy related incident that resulted in patient death uh, early on in 2011. Uh, as a result, a, a task force was uh, established and a work group uh, had looked into the uh, incident and eventually uh, come up with a corporate uh, nursing guideline in 2016 on uh, tracheostomy management. And our team was charged to uh, teach or to disseminate this guideline and teach the nurses how to, how to do uh, proper tracheostomy care and how to deal with the emergencies. So uh, in 2016, we did a survey uh, before our intervention. Um, not surprisingly, uh, many of those, uh, uh, many of our nurses have experience in managing patients with temporary tracheostomy and permanent tracheostomy. However, in terms of management of clinical emergencies in relation to tracheostomy, uh, the proportion of positive experience or having experience in such um, uh, management of emergency is relatively low. So what we did is alongside with some briefing sessions and didactic lectures, we have developed a 1.5 hour simulation training uh, session which cover four major uh, clinical emergency situations that may happen with temporary or permanent tracheostomies. So the result, uh, we have trained up uh, 262 nurses um, they are law and ICU nurses um, uh, in a five-month period. Uh, they are relatively young nurses with an uh, average uh, year of service of three years. And uh, about half of them have actually uh, underwent uh, classroom-based teaching in the past uh, before they come to our simulation training. And in comparison of the two type of training, about uh, Sixty percent of them prefer simulation training, and this is the self-reported confidence and competency level. As you can see, the the um, there's a statistically significant increase in both levels um, after the simulation training. So, for case number two, uh, is a bit on ECMO. Although I was told not to talk about ECMO in this conference because there are a lot of uh, ECMO sessions here, but I, I just want to let you know that um, uh, or to use ECMO as an uh, example to illustrate uh, why it's important uh, for um, simulation. So for ECMO, uh, doctors must undergo successful cannulation uh, in order to initiate ECMO. And any error in such a procedure can result in uh, catastrophe. And in the past, before people having uh, simul using simulation um, for ECMO cannulation training, uh, the doctors heavily rely on training on animal models or practice on real patients. But uh, as you can imagine, there can be significant risk uh, if you are having a um, low fees doctor practicing ECMO cannulation on a real patient. So what we did is we have uh, invented an ammo cannulation simulator uh, that is uh, per aimed for percutaneous cannulation. So the doctors can actually practice ultrasound guided uh, cannulation or fluoroscopy guided cannulation. And also the, some components in this 
model can be modified so as to simulate different uh, clinical problems like uh, loss of guide wire or, or force tracking. So uh, we have uh, used it in Hong Kong as well as in other parts of the world uh, when we do a cannulation workshop with uh, local uh, uh, organizations, especially for, with ELSO. And uh, for Hong Kong, we have did a bit of uh, uh, evaluation and the product evaluation rating uh, was quite high. So it was a, about 4.5 point out of a five point uh, scale. So representing that the model is of high uh, realism. On the other hand, we also uh, inquire uh, the, the participants and uh, about uh, conf their confidence in cannulation and the competent, perceived competence in cannulation. And again, there's a statistically significant increase in both uh, levels after the, they have received the simulation training. So I, I would like to ask at this point, so do you think our simulation programs are successful? Well, I see some nod and some shake their heads. Yep. So, uh, so why uh, do you do you think they are not successful, or why do you think they are successful, and how do we define a successful sim training? I think there are some important points that we need to note about simulation. Um, when when it comes to someone who is new to simulation, I think many of them will immediately think about a high fidelity mannequin. Yes, that is part of the simulation, but that's not all about simulation. Someone may think about uh, technology, especially for the uh, new generation. They will think about VR, AR, and use of uh, a computer-based simulation. Yes, again, that is a good tool, but that is not all about simulation. Uh, for the simulation uh, organizers, of course, they they will think about the hard works that they need to do in preparation of a, of a simulation session. For quality and safety people, simulation may be a crew, equal to crew resource management. For educators, it will very likely be debriefing. And of course, for administrators, it's also linked with money because you have to invest a lot before you get a, a, a sim program running. So um, from the Society of Simulation and Healthcare, actually the definition, I, I think most of you may have heard it, is that it's a technique that creates a situation or environment that allows person to experience a representation of the real event for the purpose of practice, learning, evaluation, testing, and to gain understanding of the systems or human action. Uh, in this relation, I think it's important that we match simulation with the essential skill steps, the level of competence, and the service, especially. So uh, again, I would like to take reference to the uh, app mode div uh, service. As you can see, uh, there are different types of skill sets that an app mode nurse or app mode physician need to equip before the MO service can be in place and be safely pro provided to the uh, patients. So if you do not match the essential skill set with the simulation scenario or simulation program that you design, there's no way that you can improve patient safety with your simulation program. Um, I think some of you may have kids or, or you have experienced teaching uh, children's. So take reference to the uh, learning process of the kids. As you can see, this is when they read the books, uh, they, they start reading. There are different levels of uh, learning from guided learning uh, or guided reading to sort of reading with help or later on they can read individually. So it's very much the same in clinical practice. What do you, you have to have in your mind? What is the end point that you want to achieve um, when you are doing a simulation program? Uh, this 
uh, slide is about surface, and this is the one that I like the most, because for most people, or for some people who, who is new to simulation, they, they, will, they are eager to get the money to, to run a simulation program or get the resource to run a simulation program. And once they get the resource, they will then think about, okay, now I have the money, I have the mannequin or equipment, so what program should I run uh, for, for the staff? But actually that is wrong. If you look at this model, you will see that actually it should start with the surface. So actually, what is wrong with your surface? Is, it, is there a gap in your surface? Is it that your, your nurses or your doctors do not know how to do something uh, in relation to patient care? Or is it a new surface that you, you need to de uh, develop or, or uh, provide so that you need to train up your doctors or nurses or allied health uh, uh, colleagues. And then you, you go to the training piece. And there are a lot of uh, methodology, methodology to provide training and education. And simulation is just one of those uh, uh, training methodologies. Uh, there can be didactic lectures, bedside coachings, uh, problem-based learning, uh, self-directed learning, online uh, education, so on and so forth. There's a whole list of uh, strategies that you can use to train up your, uh, your staff or target participants. So do not just think about simulation. And what is more important is that after you have provided the training or simulation program to your participants, always go through the evaluation process, which is very important. So for evaluation, uh, it can be, you can look at the training outcomes, you can look at service outcome, and you can look at uh, patient outcome. And for some time, uh, sometimes simulation is used uh, as a tool to evaluate the uh, uh, service provision. Like in this one, uh, we are using simulation not only to provide training, but to evaluate the uh, transfer of patient, uh, infectious patient who was put on ECMO, and how the team transfer the patient safely from hospital A to another hospital B. Um, the evaluation of simulation, as I've mentioned, is very important. Uh, it provides the most meaningful information for determination of the value of the training. Uh, you can make use of direct transfer evidence, that is, they, uh, you compare the performance data uh, in the simulation context with the uh, performance in the uh, clinical context. You can use indirect transfer evidence, that is, you compare the performance in the uh, simulation context with the measured outcome uh, associated with performance in the uh, clinical context. And institutional data is uh, always helpful in that regard. For example, the patient's length of stay, uh, mortality, uh, the team's response time, uh, procedural accuracy, any uh, deviation from the uh, 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 guidelines or, or uh, the procedural adherence. So these are very important uh, data that you need to collect in order to evaluate a simulation program. Uh, performance assessment is very important. Um, it provides confirmatory evidence that a team or an individual is able to demonstrate competency. And in relation to performance assessment, the value of simulation here is that it provides a controlled environment uh, to uh, perform uh, or to conduct a performance simula uh, assessment. It provides a foundation to establish performance standards, and at the same time, it provides potential for faci to facilitate performance-based uh, credentialing. So sim-based performance, some points to note is that contextual fidelity does affect uh, the outcome. So contextual fatality is very important. Uh, all performance matrix that you use must be validated. Uh, the assessment context must reflect the performance construct. And 
Finally, uh, the measurement uh, demonstrate equivalence in relevant applied performance context is also very important. Now, many people will use checklists. I think there are good side and downside about checklists. It's objective, uh, it's very structured, it can differentiate the performance between lovis and experts. It's, um, yeah, as long as it's validated, it's a very robust tool. But on the other hand, um, some participants may memorize the checklist so that it will defeat the, the purpose of um, using a checklist. And sometimes it's difficult to use a checklist to assess complex skills. So there are both pros and cons of using checklists. Um, sustainability of the effect of training is also very important. And for most uh, simulation program, usually this part is very much neglected. Uh, I would like to uh, draw upon the paper uh, written by Bishoy and his group. It's uh, about uh, using high fidelity simulation training uh, which was uh, conducted on, on a group of uh, career care fellows in management of uh, ECMO emergency. And it's an RCT So what this group did was that they have, uh, they provide a scenario uh, to the uh, career care physicians, uh, the, the fellows, and then they, they assess the performance. And afterwards, this group of uh, participants were divided into uh, intervention group, which underwent simulation training for handling of emergency, versus the control group, which used the traditional water drill method to, for training. And then afterwards, they also measured uh, the performance of these two groups at different time points, that is at six weeks and um, at uh, one year. And not surprisingly, uh, the group uh, who underwent uh, simulation training performed better. And I, maybe you are not doing ECMO, but uh, I think this is the uh, type of uh, program evaluation that we can adopt and use in our daily practice if you are doing simulation training. Because it shows that the, or it proved that uh, the candidates or the participants of your program can uh, not only can acquire the skill, but also they can maintain the skill and the effect is sustainable. So in conclusion, um, I think simulation uh, require a lot of uh, planning in order to make it a success and always establish a link between simulation and patient care service, and this is very important. Do not just you make up a simulation program because you have the money or you have a personal interest in the use of simulation education. And finally, I think establishing a simulation program is very a pain. It is there are a lot of work and it's very painful, but uh, at the same time, it can be very rewarding because it definitely will improve patient safety. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you.